give him credit. I mean, he's a heck of a writer, and then there are lots of other people that are, are writing on this topic as well, of course, Rehnquist and, and uh, uh, John Paul Stevens, and especially Sandra Day O'Connor. And, uh, and they're all such incredible writers. And so we get to read this body of, of work by all these great writers, and it's just, it's really exciting stuff. And it's all about, you know, big philosophical ideas. What is property? What is government? How do they work together? Um, how do we uh, um, uh, distinguish between appropriate regulation and inappropriate regulation? All oh, really cool public policy issues. Isn't that great? You know, it's February. <laughs> okay. So we were up, we had pretty much thrashed through the majority of the in the Pennsylvania cold case. Remind me, who was going to address the dissenting opinion? Matthew, great. So Matthew, uh, another great um, uh, intellectual giant, Louis Brandeis, um, writing uh, for the dissent. Somebody was asking about you know, what does it mean to be a, a dissenting uh, writer with dissenting opinion? It means you're in the minority. Right? You've got nine justices on the Supreme Court. Um, and in order uh, to resolve a case a particular way, there has to be a, a majority of five votes um, uh, in favor of that particular opinion or position. Um, and uh, that means there could be as many as four uh, people who disagree, and occasionally, not all the time, um, they, they take the trouble of writing the reasons for their disagreement. And that's what a dissenting opinion is. Um, and so Brandeis is writing for the dissent, meaning that he, and we don't know how many people are but dissenting with him, but we know what he's saying. Um, it, it may be by himself, or it may be him and three others. Again, why would they be divided in some way? It's like, this is kind of crazy. I mean, it could be a filter back to the Supreme Court. No. Okay, so it can't be a so, what's, what's the point of value Well, um, just think about the makeup, the psychological makeup that people could get uh, appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you think they're just going to say, oh, okay, yeah, yes, I have a meeting with you. They are, they're not easily uh, dissuaded from their opinion. And, uh, and if, if they think the majority is wrong, by golly, they want the world to know about it. And a part of it is just to satisfy their own intellectual machismo. And believe me, there's plenty of that. Um, and, and, it's, it, and it's gender neutral. We get plenty of uh, intellectual machismo. Um, but it's also because they are, they're not describing uh, uh, for this case. Um, regardless, the, the majority of uh, uh, the people who are writing, uh, the, the justices that write the majority of them are not just writing for this case. The reason they take the cases is because the case uh, is an opportunity to articulate broader legal issues um, uh, that go beyond the four corners of a particular dispute. Um, and uh, and so they're writing to the agents, whether they're writing to the majority or the dissent. And um, today's dissent might be tomorrow's majority. And in fact, um, I mentioned this to someone on the way out on Tuesday. Um, uh, this is not the first time that Holmes has articulated these ideas. Um, that's one of the reasons why they read so well, is because he's written this stuff before. In earlier cases, as a dissent, dissenting justice, as part of the minority. And over time, he's kind of honed his arguments and, uh, and worked on his colleagues. And uh, it, with the right case and the right situation, he was able to attract a majority of the votes uh, to his position. And so that's another reason for writing um, a dissent is that it, it may prove to be the winning idea at some point in the future. So, uh, so Matthew, what, what, how does, well, let's maybe do it to kind of set you up here. Um, 
uh, to succeed, not to fail. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So we review what Holmes uh, said. We, we, have, we know that um, that government um, uh, can regulate and can regulate in ways that have negative impacts on the value of real property. She said government can hardly function if it's prohibited from doing that. Um, but at a certain point, the burden becomes unfair. The advantage to the public is being borne um, too heavily by an individual or uh, just a handful of individuals. Um, and at that point, um, the regulation ceases to be uh, an exercise of, or just an exercise of police power, but it has also morphed into or added to its um, uh, impact. In, uh, the, the functional equivalent of an exercise of eminent domain power. And that happens when the regulation goes too far. Um, and he's not going to split hairs here on exactly when too far is, but in his point of view, this is a 100% take. So, so we understand uh, Holmes' uh, uh, position is that the, um, the pre-regulation value equals this amount, and the amount of the amount taken by the regulation the dollar amount taken by the regulation is one, meaning it's a total take, it's a hundred percent. Right? And that uh, this is not, he, he, he's at pains to distinguish this from Hatchet versus Sebastian, and that long and from Mother. So this is, uh, this is the amount, um, so we have. Uh, regulation or please power more into eminent domain if it goes, goes too far. I don't know if that's Um, that's point number one. Point number two, this goes too far because it takes the entire estate. And this is not Hatchet versus Sebastian or Mother versus Hens because we are not being the music. And that's the exact opposite of what this kind of art argues. Yes, so I did set you up. You did set me up well. Yes. So, so how does he, um, how does he go through these different uh, issues? Well, from what I read, he argues that coal in place is just land, and you can't use your land to create a nuisance to an, an adjoining property, which undermining the uh, structural stability of a house next door to it could count as creating a nuisance. Right, but even the, the, the house that's on top of it. The house on top of it, right? Yeah, that's what I'm. So it's not that adjacent property. So well, adjacent vertically, I guess it's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So what has he changed here? He's, he's argued not, he's that not, he doesn't disagree with this, right? Right. Is it is a fundamental philosophical principle? Yeah, sure. If it goes too far, fine. That's just begging the question. Is it not? What is too far? So it it's really down to here, right? These two issues. First on this one. He's, isn't, he's arguing that coal is just, just land when it, before it gets mined, so it needs to be looked at as land. Right, right. so remember our, our diagram here. Here's the surface, mm -hmm. here's the house, here's the coal. And according to um, Holmes, this is the unit of analysis. Right. And then he says that imposing to protect the public health, safety, and morals 
from dangerous threats is not a taking. So, but that's saying, kind of, that, that sounds. Yeah, it goes back to being arguing. But let's, let's, let's stay with this. Okay, sorry. So, so if this is the if this is Holmes' frame of analysis, mm -hmm. what is Brandeis's? He's arguing that um, the value is in that the extraction of the coal, and you've limited, you've, you've prevented him from being able to. You, no, you've already said it. So I want you to go back and reflect on what you said. It said the value of the coal is in it, it's before it's it's mine. It's land. It's land. Yeah. Oh yes, that, that's what the dissenting guy is arguing. Yes. Yeah. So, so what is what is Brandeis's? He's the dissent. Uh -huh, what, right. what does what's Brandeis's frame of analysis? If this is Holmes's. Brandeis is arguing that uh, they're just adjacent properties, right? And he's creating a nuisance by. Quiet. No. So uh, let's look at the language that, that where he talks about this. Um, yeah. Is it here where he talks about the restrictions upon the use do not become inappropriate as a means merely because it deprives the owner? of the only use to which the property can be profitable. <laughs> That's kind of a side issue. I, I want to go before, okay. uh, I think, uh, to the next, further down. Top of 349 is where he talks about this. In that first full paragraph on 349. Limits of the police power have been exceeded in the extent of the resulting diminution Diminution of value. Yeah. yeah. Is it, is it about, about the third sentence? Just values are relative. Values are relative. So he's he's acknowledging this calculation, right? Values are relative, and so we are. We, he are, he's saying, okay, we we will be doing comparison here because we're buying this notion that. Going too far with regulation results in in, in an exercise of eminent domain. Then, what? How do you define too far? Well, in comparison to something else. And what Holmes is comparing it to is this part here. So this is the both the pre-regulation uh, um, value and the, the amount that was taken. Are both that, but Brandeis says, okay, they are relative, but if we are to consider the value of the coal kept in place by the restriction, we should compare it to the value of other all other parts of the land. So, if I were to diagram this, where does the bracket go? Vertically. So, yeah. How much of it? The whole bit. A whole bit. So this is Brandeis's frame of analysis. So he's saying, okay, we buy this idea, we buy this idea. What it really comes down to is what number do you put in the denominator? And this has become known as the denominator issue. Mm -hmm. And it governs the outcome or explains the outcome in most taking cases. Um, because if it is, if it's a relative measure and we know it's uh, taking, if it goes too far, then the question really does come down to what, you, what numbers are you using for the comparison? You know, figuring out how much was taken, that's usually pretty easy to figure out, but what are you comparing it against and what percentage of the total is that? Yeah, expensive. What about the notion that first in time is first in line? Um, if we're seeing Paul Zalo, that doesn't really matter. Didn't they purchase the house and, or the property and build the house on it, knowing that they didn't have that right? Well, this has to do with a fairness issue that uh, Matthew's already referenced, and we'll come back to. But I don't want to uh, I don't want to go there yet. I'm going to finish this because this is this is key to understanding all this stuff. This is Brandeis's. Uh, uh, reference for her and his estimation of what the denominator should be in this comparison. He's still keeping the same numerator. It's still this is what was taken, right? Because mm -hmm. that's pretty clear. That's not a problem. But it, it's com in comparison to what? 
And Holmes is saying it's in comparison to just exactly what this particular owner owned. And Brandeis is saying, no, it's in comparison to the whole estate of the entire property. Oh. Um, and you may say, well, wait a minute. The whole estate is owned by two people. By different, yeah, two different entities. So why are we doing that? It's a philosophical point. And this is, this is probably the hardest case uh, to make that philosophical point, but we will see it later. Um, in, for example, in Palazzolo, we got a 20-acre parcel, 18 of which are, are um, jurisdictional wetlands, meaning that you can't build on them. And so you got this little piece here, you know, 10 per, uh, two acres, 10% of the land. And he ask, is this a, a total take? Is this a situation like Holmes describes with this coal? Well, it is if you, only, if you only look at the 18 acres. If the, if the value uh, calculation is, well, we had 18 acres of, of buildable land before, and we have 18 acres taken away uh, through these wetlands restrictions, then that's a total take, right? But that's not all that Paul Zola owns. The parcel itself is, in fact, 20 acres. And so this is not 0.1, it's 0.9, or it's not 1, it's 0.9. And so uh, is that still compensable? Maybe, but it's not the same as saying that it's all gone. He's saying there is some residual value. That there's still some value. It's not a complete take. And so we can still argue about whether it, whether it has gone too far. Now we are in the process of splitting hairs, right? which Holmes was trying to avoid in his analysis. Um, Brandeis has the luxury of being a minority. When you are the dissenter, you can pretty much say whatever you want to because it's not doesn't carry the uh, rule of law, right? And so Brandeis is making this philosophical statement by saying, let's look, and it's a, it's a landscape-based statement. The, the planners out there should like this. It's based on you know, a, a, a kind of inclusive um, landscape type of analysis. Let's not split hairs about with who owns which estate, which portion of this land. It's all land. And if we're looking at how much has been regulated versus how much is not, um, it doesn't matter. And, and, and really, if you look beyond this particular situation, because this is a statewide law, right? It applies in top, throughout uh, Pennsylvania. There, there may be plenty of situations where the entire estate is owned by a single owner. And so Brandeis is saying that's how we should be evaluating the validity of this law. It is a, it's not completely a satisfactory a, a answer to the, to the issue, I don't think, because this is an as-applied case. But um, that he is articulating this, this uh, point of view that actually does become um, a standard part of taking this jurisprudence in the future. And so, Jaron, this, this, this dissenting opinion very much has that effect because we now um, uh, look to this, this calculation, look to Brandeis's opinions for making determinations about how much has been taken um, through how much value has been taken through regulation. Okay, so let's move on to the other issues. On nuisance, what, what, what does uh, Brandeis say? They tell us about that? He says that. Um, that they're creating a nuisance by their activity of mining. Yeah, I, you know, um, it, it, having people's houses fall into the, right. you know, big pit in the ground. It, that sounds a like a nuisance. A little bit of a nuisance. I mean, if we're if, if it's a if it's a nuisance to, to brew beer and to manufacture bricks, then having houses fall into the ground. I mean, <laughs> yeah, probably. And then he comes up with hypotheticals. Lawyers love doing this. You hear me do it all the time. Uh, say, well, what if it was noxious gases that were released by the mine, right? right. With, and you know that made people sick or kill them, um, and that does happen. Um, you know, would it be a taking for the state to prohibit the mining of the coal that was re responsible for the release of those toxic gases? No. So you know, saying that that okay, that's okay. You can regulate that and not compensate it because that's a nuisance. But this is. Not a nuisance, and so you have to compensate for it. 
Um, I, I don't know. I, you know, every time I teach this case, I have a different opinion on who I think has the better argument. Today, I think it's Brandeis. Last year, I thought it was uh, I thought it was Hobbes. But okay, so now let's talk about the equity issue that Spencer brought up. Where are the equities lying? Think about okay, you're you're Mr. You're Mr. Man. You're you want to buy. Uh, a house, um, let's say uh, you, you want to build a house, you're an architect, um, and so you want, you want to buy a, a lot of land, piece of land, you're going to design and build a house on it and for your family, and uh, you're thinking about this particular uh, lot um, right here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, this one right there, and um, you could um, buy the entire estate, meaning that you would own the subsurface rights as well as the surface rights and the air rights and all the other rights. Um, but you're thinking, well, you know, I could save money um, by selling it. If I take by you know, not buying the, the subsurface rights, I could save money by just you know buying the surface rights. It would cost me less, and I could, you know it would be more affordable. But it's kind of you know, and I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in mining coal, right? Um, it's not my business, so yeah, it sounds okay. I don't, I'm not really interested in owning coal. So um, you get a, 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 a break on the on the on the uh, purchase price of the land. And now the state legislature comes in and kind of bails you out. Holmes says, "What? This is a windfall." Right? Yeah, it's a windfall. He didn't get, he got more than what he bargained for. Right, because now he more or less owns right. all the way down to hell. So he's getting the benefit, and, 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 and it may very well be soon. Uh, he's getting the benefit <laughs> of, of something that he didn't pay for. He's getting, he's getting this subsurface, he didn't pay for this, he's getting this uh, subsurface uh, right essentially gratis. <laughs> that's what Holmes says. That's not bad. That's, you know, I mean, if the state were coming in and paying for that and went, wanting to do that for Mr. Mann and other people like him, well, fine. He's still getting, you know, a good deal, but the state is paying for it. We're uh, essentially spreading the risk um, or maybe spreading the poor um, choices of people like Mr. Mann across the entire tax base. Um, but here, it's all falling on one another private entity. Pennsylvania Coal and that's not fair. Yeah, Ed. So did he ever get paid for the property, or did he just kind of let the house in? Oh, we, oh, we don't know. I mean, this, this is the, the, um, the, yeah, I know. It's really unsatisfying. You get these great stories, these great narratives with people, you know, they're, they're kind of, you know, Herculean, you know, and it's, it's, it's like Greek drama with the gods, you know, throwing thunderbolts, and then you don't find out how it ends. <laughs> We don't find out what, what was the result. It's really unsatisfying. But um, we do, occasionally we do. Um, what would, I don't know that Brandeis addresses this, but how do you think he would address that same fairness argument? I guess he would say it anything protecting the, um, <coughs> this, this happens in nuisance law all the time, I guess. That'd be one way. Wrong feeling. Like it could, nuisance law could always be construed as. What about the, the coal benefiting company? Mm -hmm. The coal company had the same. Oh, it, it, yeah, they took that same risk, right? Had, you had the same choices, mm. right? And the coal company, um, by uh, by act of the majority opinion here, it's the coal company that's getting the windfall, is it not? They could have come and bought the surface rights. They chose not to. Mm. I mean, maybe they didn't always, in every situation, have that choice, right? So maybe in this specific situation, we don't know the circumstances, maybe they didn't have the choice. But, you know, money, it's, at some point, your beloved house, you know, if they offer you enough for it, they'll say, mm, yeah, I think I can have another beloved house some other place with that kind of money, and I'll be able to afford the subsurface rights also. Um, yeah, the, the, there, there is going to be a windfall here, the, uh, you know, the, the way this is set up, one side or the other, 
is going to get something that they didn't pay for. And what, with the way the majority opinion turns out in this, it's the coal company that is getting that windfall. They did not pay for the service rights for this piece of coal, and they're getting the whole shebang. Right? So did they mine it, or did they just get paid? They get paid the equivalent. No, like I said, I, I, just to say that, I don't, you, could, you could do the research. I always tell students, they want to know the answer. That's, I don't know. You guys look it up. No one does. No one does. No one does. You get home and say, like, I can look that up or I can watch three rounds of Law and Order. <laughs> so, so maybe I don't get it. They were, they were awarded. The court said, no way, time out. It's a taking. So then they get a just compensation, right? You, they, unless, so, there's, there's, unless, the, unless the state backs off, and the state can, it can change its regulations. Um, we, we find out later that it, even if it does that, it owes money for the temporary taking, uh, essentially the rental value. Even if the state comes back and says, oh, really? Oh, that's a taking? Oh, man, silly us. We had no idea. Well. We'll just change that right now. Just look. We'll just zip, zip, zip that law. Yeah, gone. It's all gone. Have a nice day. That's the way it used to go. And somebody brought, we, I don't think we were going to read this case, but somebody brought a, a lawsuit that said, you know what? Even in that situation when you do that, you still owe money, rental value, essentially, for the period of time that the law was in effect. And so it's called temporary. Um, but uh, one way or another, yeah, after this ruling, um, we, we get um, the state paying the, the man's, or paying the coal company, excuse me, some money. So they pay them some money. They don't have to mine it, but they get the value of it, right? Yeah. I, I assume the guy stayed in his house. Yeah. And so, well, and, and, and that's the windfall. I, I, I think you kind of referenced and said they got all the value, and I'm like, I, I, I'm not following how they got all the value. Well, aren't they just getting the value for the coal? They're just getting the value for the coal. Oh, okay. They're just getting the value for the coal. And um, and I suppose I suppose you're right. It's not a complete windfall for the the coal company. But they get profit without having to lift a finger. So that's kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what? Like I say, what frequently happens is that this state back down on these things. And 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 uh, be under the old law as it was back then, the state would, and this probably happened. This is my guess: is the state probably um, uh, repealed the law um, and to eliminate the liability. Um, and once the law was repealed, the coal company then was not restricted. And this is where the this is where the um, the uh, windfall comes. from. Uh, to the coal company, oh, because no, now it is no longer restricted, okay. and then go in there, take the coal, and you know the house falls, right? Okay. So that's that's how that works. I knew that was an explanation. Why doesn't why doesn't this apply as implied easement? But on whose part? So uh, the house is occupying that side that they can dig it up because the house is part of the capital as a that they have to have the right company. Um, that's, you've ever thought about law school? That's a, that's a creative argument. Um, I, I, easement is usually not um, uh, applied uh, to subsurface um, uh, mineral interests, and so it would be a, a, um, a unique application of that area of the law. And of course, if that's what you were arguing, you'd want the court to think it was just a small little extension, not a wholesale change. Oh, Your Honor, this is just where this just follows naturally. It, it's just a small little step from what's already established from centuries of jurisprudence. And, and of course, the other side would say, Your Honor, the sky is falling. Um, uh, they, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that that would win. Because it, is, it, is it really occupied when you know it's not right at the surface, it's below the surface? And when this is already the subject of somebody else's rights, and, and how would you, uh, an implied easement, you know, it, it, it is uh, a prescriptive easement, um, has as one of its, as you know, one of its requirements that it is occupied by.
by the non-owner? And how do you occupy a vein of coal that's you know, way underground? That's interesting. Josh? Uh, they actually have mined underneath some of the towns back east, and it just settles down. Actually, very, very minimal damage. So, and, and, and probably technology is helping out here. I mean, this is cases from the 1920s, and mining technology is improved, we presume. Um, and, uh, and so they're able, and it's certainly in the coal, uh, coal company's interest, um, uh, long term in business interests, um, to solve these um, uh, problems through engineering. So we would expect there's probably some, some resolution of the Spencer. Does it matter who sold what to who? Who had the tire rights first? No, I don't think so. Because it, 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 first in time is first in right, really only with water. I was just thinking along the lines of like prior to the legislation, if, since it hadn't been in place, it probably might have made sense for them to sell it. You know, maybe they wanted to use it for agricultural uses or whatever, and it slowly morphed into where they were building houses on it. Well, stay tuned for the Polizolo case because that's really what that one's all about. So let's move on. Thank you. Uh, I had a volunteer for Lucas. I think it was Sheldon. Yes. So let's go on to um, the next um, uh, major case here, Lucas versus uh, South Carolina Coastal Commission. Another beach case. There's a whole raft of them, so to speak, um, in the 1990s and uh, 1980s, 1990s. Uh, Orianus, uh, uh, Sheldon, what, what's the case about? Um, so Lucas, looking back, they, they did a development, and they're at the tail end of the development, and they've got two lots remaining. So he ends up taking them all, ends up buying them all, so I think personally. Right. And uh, that being shortly after they have a, a um, act that keeps any building from happening, it uh, is trying to keep the coastal environment or the uh, intact. Right. And at that point, he cannot build because of that that happened after he acquired the, the lots, which were residential and everything around it was residential. In answer to, uh, to Spencer's question, would it have mattered if he bought his um, property after the regulation? Um, I think so. I. On some of the cases, they bring it up, and on this one, I don't know, because he, when they switch title, like on the other case, they switch their ownership, and they switch title, and they are a shareholder, and they switch title, and they said that wasn't the case, yeah. that it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it does strike us as humans, you know, there is a sense of fairness that has, that is driven by chronology, and order, and the, the order of events. Um, and sometimes it has an influence and sometimes it doesn't. Um, be careful in relying on it. It is, it is a, um, an unreliable factor in trying to a analyze um, a legal situation. Because, it, yes, it, it, it does, like I say, it resonates with a certain um, basic sense of fairness that we have in, in our culture. But um, it does not necessarily explain the outcome in a lot of cases. This is why, when we were talking about nuisance, you know, there was this temptation to say, okay, who was there first? Who came to the nuisance? And that, yeah, look at the pig case. You know the pig case? Pig farmer's there first. The guy, the uh, vacation own, uh, cabin owner comes in second. Of course the pig farmer wins, right? Is it, it was the order of that set of events what explained the outcome? Not really. The real issue was what was the context, what uh, the surrounding uses, and which of these competing uses was consistent with that surrounding context. And it was a farming district that was the context. So the pig farmer is more consistent with the farming district than the cabin owner. And the order of their appearance on the scene, not so important. That's really not important when you look at something like uh, the Brick case, Hattachuk versus Sebastian, right? It was the Brick guy was there first. But the surrounding context at the time of the case was urban residential. Well, it's Los Angeles. Suburban residential. Right? And so the court's very quick to say, I mean, it's not a nuisance case directly, but they're very quick to analogize. Yes, analogize. 
um, to nuisance in upholding the regulation by saying, you know what, the context of the surrounding neighborhood is, in, is different from the offending use here, or the allegedly offending use, and so that allegedly offending use is the one that's going to have to give way, right, even though they were first. So sometimes birth order, <laughs> sometimes event order um, uh, has an influence. Sometimes it's a de determinative, but not always. So be careful of that. It seems like in the taking cases, it seems like they, that gets brought up by one side or the other. But most of them come down to those three things, which this one does with the amount taken for sure. Right. So so um, just to give a, a sense of our regulation here. This is uh, the mean high time. This is the real mean shark. No, this is the mean high time, the average high time. Um, and that is a, 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 a property boundary um, in every coastal state. Um, the mean high tide is where um, the uh, private interests end. So we've got two lots here owned by David Lucas, um, and his ownership rights end at the mean high tide, the eastern boundary, the inside. The state owns from the mean high tide out to five miles. Those are state waters. So South Carolina owns that, which means it's publicly owned. Which means whenever you're in a, a coastal area and you want to walk along the beach and you're not sure if you're going to get shot at or something, uh, you still might get shot at. I can't guarantee you that. But uh, you will be within your rights as a member of the public to walk along the beach seaward of where this line is. So if you're splashing in the water, you may not be exactly sure where the mean high tide is, but if, you're, if your feet are splashing in the water, you are on state land as you walk along. Um, beyond five miles, out to 200 miles, is um, what's called the um, EEZ, the Exclusive Economic Zone. And that is, uh, that's at 200 miles. That is territory um, that is controlled by the United States um, or the, the surrounding country. But according to the um, International um, Law of the Sea Treaty, um, uh, every nation state um, has an EEZ where they can control what happens. Um, on, at least on, well, on the surface and, and on, on, the, um, on the ocean floor, um, out to 200 miles. Um, and so those are some of the um, uh, jurisdictional boundaries. Now, going landward, we get, after, after the sale of the property from the corporation to Mr. Lucas, this is his retirement you know, money. That's basically what this is. This is his, his uh, IRA. Uh, the state... Uh, passes a law that creates no build line, and I don't know exactly where it falls, let's just make it really clear, let's say it's here, and everything seaward of that line is in a no build zone. Um, and so all of a sudden his property, and it does happen after he acquires it, but it's him acquiring it from his company, right? So it's like him giving it to himself, I mean it's, you know, David Lucas as a you know, close, close corporation versus David Lucas as an individual, right? So it's, you know, what is that really a, a, a change in ownership? Not really. Um, so, at the time he wants to build, this is essentially, these lots are essentially unbuildable. Anybody been to this place? This is the um, Isle of Palms, right? Um, just um, east of, of Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, you have? So what's it like there? I've never been. It's nice. Uh, nice sandy beaches. Well, they actually want to do beaches. I think. Did you uh, do any, did you stay right here on this lot? Yeah, we <laughs> stayed. In yeah, David Lucas is a good friend, friend of mine. No. <laughs> he, he doesn't know me anymore. Yeah, right. So, um, uh, is this an area that is uh, prone um, to uh, hurricane damage? Yeah. 
Yeah, this, this whole island has been um, uh, overtopped uh, by uh, tidal, um, high uh, storm tidal action. Um, it, it, it really is very fragile um, it, it, environmentally. Um, and which is, of course, when you go out and disturb these kinds of places, um, you are doing damage to the environment, but you're also doing damage um, to um, other um, parts of the land because um, these uh, barrier um, islands um, have played critical roles in moderating the effects of storm surges from uh, uh, tropical storms, um, and uh, which can dissipate their energy before they hit the, the real mainland. And so when these things get messed up, they, um, uh, their ability to serve that function is impeded, which puts the rest of the land and the rest of the development of the land, which in this case is Charleston, hello, the biggest city in the state, um, now at more uh, of a risk from damage from storms. So this is the motivation, because you think South Carolina, man, are they liberal or what? They're messing with everybody's property rights like this? I thought that was a pretty conservative state until I read this case, and I said, these guys are a bunch of liberals. No, it's just because they have been beaten over the head so many times by hurricanes, that, and, and they understand the science uh, and, and the role that barrier islands play in trying to um, uh, be storm uh, secure, that they're, they're trying to do something. So, um, so, so the Isle of Palms, it, it, it's so it, we are, we're led to understand here that it must be a, um, a wilderness, right? Completely unbuilt, um, no structures anywhere inside, the state's done its job. It's quite a few, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, it's fully built up. And in fact, it, 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 you know, talk about a great thing for our economy. We go out there, we build this, these houses, and every 10 years, a hurricane comes in and rips them all out. <laughs> and then we go back in there, and with what? With taxpayer money, because that's where flood insurance comes from, folks. We're all paying for it. With taxpayer money, they go back out there, and they build them all over again. Talk about a stimulation package. <laughs> it's just a seawall with homes. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's a seawall with windows, right? Exactly, indoors. <laughs> and hot tubs. Um, yeah, that, that's basically what happens along major sections of, of our, both our coastlines, but especially the East Coast. So, yeah, uh, Lucas has already built um, homes here, here, here. I mean, it goes both directions for quite a ways. And it's just these two here that you're being empty, basically. And so this is the perfect case to get this kind of result, right? Because when you look at the equities of the case, you say, well, let's look at this. Oh, um, gosh, there are an awful lot of houses already built here. And the state comes along and says, no more building. And it's like, uh, mm, that seems uh, ill-timed and ill-directed. And, and Scalia is happy to tell him as much. So, um, so what do we take from this case? Uh, on this one, so with Lucas, he's not arguing against the act itself, right? Which was interesting because I think the way you approach in legal work is what you're going into. If you don't go in the right way, you're going to lose it. And so he went in acknowledging that he's not against that act; he's against the value, which they end up saying there was no value, it was valueless. Where South Carolina was saying that it threatened the public uh, beachfront, which wasn't the case. It was a nuisance, so he ended up winning because of the money. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a retread of the Pennsylvania coal case. You know? It's basically the same thing. Because we have a, 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 a um, trial court determination that there is no economic value left in the product, <coughs> which means this. Right? The amount that you had and the amount that was taken are equivalent. There's no economic value left to the property. And when that happens, um, then I take it can't occur. So this is one of two bright line rules that we have in taking this law. This is called the wipeout test or the Lucas test. When, when there is a determination that there is no economic value left in the property, 
then that's a bright line. Um, and it's almost it's an almost automatic um, um, rule that a taking has occurred and compensation is due. Um, what was the other bright line rule? It, was, it wasn't involved in this case, but the court discusses it. Versus uh, Manhattan teleprompter um, is the case we keep seeing again and again and again. We never read it directly. Do you ever feel left out? Maybe we'll put it online so that you can read it on there if you really, really want to read it. Get ready to that right after I find out what happened in the Pennsylvania cold case. Um, <laughs> I'm planning that trip. I'll be traveling out there to see what we're doing. Okay, there we go. He's going to do on site research. Well, there we go. Um, Loretta versus uh, Manhattan Teleprompter was a case where the um, New York City City Council authorized cable companies um, to uh, go into onto uh, uh, privately owned properties throughout Man uh, well throughout New York and certainly in Manhattan um, to install um, the hardware for for cable television. And you'd say, why would anyone contest that? Um, I, Mrs. Loretto, I think she was just kind of old school and she didn't understand, she just did, did not understand ESPN, is all I can think. <laughs> you know, it's 24 hour sports, what's wrong with you? But she did not want that box, she didn't care how small it was, she did not want that box, that cable box on the roof of her house, or of her apartment building. And uh, what was it, it was like, you know, a couple cubic I mean, it was just look at the small little box. And then she said, by golly, I, I don't want it, and the government can't make me take it. And according to the terms of the ordinance, the government was saying that she had to take it, whether she wanted it or not. And that's why it's a taking, because, it, you know, Manhattan Teleprompter is a private corporation, right? And the, and the takings clause doesn't restrict private corporations. Um, there are other... The laws that restrict private corporations from taking property. But in the Fifth Amendment, the taking response is directed to government. It's because government authorized it. And it was by city ordinance, the city ordinance authorized the private entity, Manhattan Teleprompter, prompter, uh, to go on to Mrs. Laredo's property, install a box, and leave the box. And that is a permanent physical invasion. And even though it's small, it's still a permanent physical invasion um, that is happening because, with government's approval and a government's insistence. Uh, and when, the, when that happens, that also is another bright line. That also is an automatic taking leading to compensation. So those are our two bright lines. If there's a physical invasion by the government, First of all, if, if, if usually you think physical invasion, well, I'm thinking, you know, uh, uh, you die. You, you know, they're, they're, they're going to move their um, uh, tractors and caterpillars across my property and, you know, build a 15 lane um, uh, expansion to I 15. Um, and, uh, and so that's going to be a physical invasion. Yeah, in that kind of situation, it is a physical invasion, but they've always um, cleared the way first through an explicit exercise of eminent domain when. You know, the government comes knocking on your door and saying, we, we, we need to take your property because we're expanding the, the freeway, and uh, do, you can deal with this peaceably, or we can go to court. What's your choice? And uh, that's eminent domain, right? That's not what we're talking about here when we talk about physical invasion in the Loretto um, case. Um, or in the Pompelli case, the one with the, with the dam and the reservoir with the water back there. That's also a physical invasion case. In both those situations, the government didn't do that. They didn't come to the door and say, we want your land. They just did whatever they were going to do. In the Pompeii case, they built the dam. In the Loretto case, they passed the ordinance. And it was, it caused an perhaps unintended, you know, maybe not so unintended, physical invasion by the government. And in those situations, 
that is always compensable. So physical invasion and a total wipeout. Those are two examples, there are two instances where, excuse me, um, there is always a, a taking leading to compensation. So you never want to be in any of those, either of those boxes, at least un unintentionally. Um, great. So what happened at the end of the case, Sheldon? Uh, he got paid out um, over a million dollars. Yep. He got paid out, and what did the state do? They, I think they, they took the property and you make sure it's your case for all the home So with this one where they took the property back and ended up re doing a hardship? Or is that one they went to? Yeah, that was this one. So yes, they paid Mr. Lucas his uh, his, his that, the value for his property and then took title to the property. That's always key, right? You know, if, if, if you end up losing in one of these cases, make sure that you take title to the thing, you know? It's like, okay, we're gonna pay you, but now you are gonna give us that bundle of sticks. We're not just gonna pay you and let you hold the title, duh. So, um, so they take the property, and then they, uh, the state, the, the state legislature amends the law to create a hardship exception um, to the no build rule. Applies to itself. How do you do that? Applies to itself for a hardship exemption for these two properties, and of course uh, is eager to grant it to itself. <laughs> and then they, and then they turn around and sold them. Uh, to recoup the money, and I believe there are, there are now houses on these. <laughs> so, um, if you were the attorney for the state, how differently would you argue this case? What would you do differently? There. I wouldn't argue it. I'd say, hey, there's hard say, oh. there. It's done. <laughs> let's let them do it. Let's move on with their lives. Okay, okay. But let's say that's how differently I would do that, it. That is probably the, the better part of the dollar right there. But, yes, Sean. You can just say it's a health, safety, and welfare of the community not to be building the coastline. Yeah, community. how would you build that case? Just say hurricanes come through, it's going to destroy your home, it affects nearby properties, and things like that. They want debris. Yeah, but this, responders at the risk. Yeah. There, there's all sorts of science about how disturbing, um, especially the, the um, dry sand beach areas and the uh, and, uh, um, uh, first uh, uh, row of dunes, coastal dunes, uh, and disturbing the vegetation on those coastal dunes. There's all sorts of science about how that really screws up not just the environment, but puts other people in harm's way, and property, other property in harm's way. So it's not just screwing up the land where you're making the disturbance. It actually screws up the land for a lot of surrounding territory. And, and there's all sorts of, of, of science on this. And that's what is peculiar to me, is like, why didn't they do that? Because it doesn't seem like they did, or maybe they did, and the courts just, you know, Scalia just chooses to move forward, which is his prerogative. He's the Supreme Court just. Um, but it's just like, really? I mean, you really want to hone in on this, right? I mean, this is why in the next case we're going to talk about, the Stevens versus Cannon Beach, the rule in Oregon is you can't build a seawall to protect any structure that predates the uh, adoption of the um, coastal um, zone um, uh, um, statewide planning goals, which is 1979. Any structure that's built after 1979, if, if it, you know, it's in danger of falling into the ocean, saranara. Mm -hmm. See you later. Um, you know, have a nice party to watch it fall into the ocean because the this, this state will not give you a permit for the seawall. Why? Because seawalls um, uh, do incredible amounts of damage to surrounding properties, not just to the property where it's located. So yeah, I don't know why they, they didn't do that. Also, you know, um, are there other, I mean, the, the fact that the state was willing to stipulate that all the value had been taken? What kind of lawyer are you? 
You never do that. You always find some sort of economic value that's left in the land. You can have hot dog stands on it or something, you know, you know, massage cabanas, you know, and you know, places to sit drink and drink Mai Tais or something, you know. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm imagining a library with grass huts and, uh, you know, and some sort of little temporary resort. I mean, you, there are ways to make money on really nice pieces of beach. And where are their customers? They're in all these houses here. I mean, it's, you know, it could have been really profitable. It's like, where's your imagination? It's what it could have should have. So, right? I keep thinking of, well, how do you argue for nuisance and health, safety, and welfare for those two parcels when you're continuing to allow it to go on along the days? Well, yes, and, that, and thank you for bringing it back to my, uh, my senses here. Um, the, the, the Sheldon, even in this situation where there's no nuisance and it's, well, actually, let's put this one aside. Even in this situation where there's a total wipeout. Scalia acknowledges that it might not be compensable, right? There are exceptions to this categorical rule. What are they? Nu nu nuisance is one. So, so if, if actually there is an actual nuisance because of, of uh, the activities that are proposed for this piece of property, no one owns the right to be a nuisance or to have one on their land. So that's um, uh, one exception to the, the, uh, the wipeout compensation rule. What's the other one? It's like the public health safety watch. But that's that's what this one is here. And it goes down. Yeah, and that's that's kind of all the same. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, right. It's if it didn't have any uh, value before, isn't it? If they didn't, if all, if they didn't have the know. rights to create the value. If they didn't own the right that they claim was taken. And you'd say, well, that's kind of obvious, right? You're bringing a takings claim. But what Scalia is, is uh, unveiling for us is this unspoken assumption behind all these cases. The unspoken assumption is that the plaintiff in all these cases, the people who claim that they had their property taken, actually own the property right that they claim was taken. And you say, well, Lucas, he's got this title and everything, right? Well, let's go to the next case. Stevens versus Cannon Beach. Um, uh, let's see. Let's, um, Ahmed, can we uh, talk to you about Stevens? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Who wants to do Stevens? Okay, Mamita. Talk to us about Stevens versus Kennedy. Yeah, so in this case, um, Stevens versus Kennedy, it's Stevens wanted to build a seawall as a development for his motor, future motor. Right. So he asked for a permit for it, uh, but he was denied because uh, by the active dune and beach overlay zone council. Right. Good. Saying that, uh, saying that. The commercial use of the property would conflict with the goal of the LCBC. Right, and the Land Conservation and Development Commission, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. State agency in charge of the land use program. So, but the plaintiff actually uh, sued them and said that it's unconstitutional to do it because. Uh, unconstitutional because um, he acquired the property with, uh, before this decision was made. So right. it's not predated. So, right. And uh, that's what he said. And he asked for uh, uh, but the court actually didn't uh, give the decision on his behalf. The court actually gave the decision on the behalf of the defendants, saying that it's not preventing him from all the beneficial use of the property, and also the dry sand area is unfit for constructing any permanent buildings on it. And it also said that the people of Oregon had a custom of 
using the dry sand area as a recreation purpose. Right, and so and so he has no basis for arguing the, the tape, right? Yeah. So let's just draw the diagrams here. Um, And, and, and maybe I alluded to this before, and, and uh, I'm, I'm generally not a, um, a modest person, but now I'm really not modest. This is my favorite case. Uh -huh. My favorite case from when I was practicing. You'll notice I'm on. Um, and the reason it's my favorite case is because it, it the, the, the central um, decision that guided the outcome in this case was my favorite case when I was in law school. When I was a first year law student, I read this case called Gordon B. Hay. And it was just like, it just caught fire. It's just like, wow, this is so cool. And what Gordon B. Hay was all about was this situation here. And th th this, is, this is just too good for poetry, right? Um, th this is Mr. Stevens' property. Gordon B. Hay. This is, it's right next door. This is in Cannon Beach. Have you ever been to Cannon Beach? Anybody been to Cannon Beach? Yeah, beautiful, you know, big white sand beaches, great vacation town. Um, this is the Surf Sand Motel. Anybody stayed at the Surf Sand Motel? You have? Wow. Did you come back with bed bugs? <laughs> Uh, wow, Surf Sand Motel, that's Thornton's Motel here. Okay, wow, you, so you know exactly where it is. So the, the property, uh, the, the parcels look like this. Um, this is the mean high tide, so this is the, the seaward boundary, the western boundary of these properties. It's around the Pacific now, or north. And then this is the bluff line, because um, uh, uh, in Canada Beach, like a lot of the west coast, um, uh, the, the dry sand beach um, is um, uh, demarcated um, physiographically um, uh, from the rest of the dry um, land by some sort of bluff. And so this is all dry sand here to here. Uh, Thornton and the uh, Sea Sand Motel, Surf Sand Motel, is like this on the bluff. And so the road goes along here, and then the parking lot here, and here's the um, and it, it actually overlooks, it's got pretty good views, it overlooks the, the beach and so forth. So in the 1960s, Mr. Thornton um, uh, decided, uh, excuse me, Mr. Hay, what am I getting this Thornton? Thornton is the, um, the defendant. Mr. Hay, who was he? Mr. Hay um, wanted to uh, reserve uh, the dry sand area in front of his motel for his paying guests. And he owned the land, right? He owned the title to the property, all the way to the uh, uh, mean high tide. Those of you who have been in, in Cannon Beach, where, where does everybody walk? Does it, do people walk only in this area here? No, they're going up and down on like this all the time, right? And, and Mr. Hay thought that was, yeah, it just did not fit his business model. So what he wanted to do is through what, you know, it's the economy of scarcity, right? So he wanted to create this exclusive beach, beach resort kind of feel for his motel. And so um, uh, he went out and got some really high quality materials, used telephone poles. That's what he got. Discarded, creosote-soaked telephone poles. And he lined them up end to end to end to end to end like this. And that's how he created his exclusive beach resorts with these old creosote telephone poles. And, uh, and so uh, Thornton, and I got that. Thornton um, uh, was the, um, the director of the State Department of Transportation. What? The State Department of Transportation. The State Parks Department used to be part of the Department of Transportation. So State Parks was a, 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 a subset of the DOT. And, and you'll understand why in a second. It's, it's not as peculiar as you think. Uh, so Thornton uh, files legal action uh, it's seeking an injunction against Hay to take the poles out. Get rid of those um, creosote poles. And like, if you understand what I'm talking about, he's not using them as fence posts, right? He's just putting them end to end, lying them on the beach. Is he crazy? 
What happens the next time there's a tropical storm that runs through here? What do those poles become? Javelins. <laughs> he's nuts, right? So he's uh, uh, Thornton sues Hay to remove the poles. It goes uh, to the state court. Um, and the first court says what? What do you think the first court said? That your property keep it. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, no. It decides with the state. Prescriptive easement. Prescriptive easement, exactly. Very good. So, because what are the clues here? People have been walking up and down for years. For years. And the, here, you know, these are the attorneys in South Carolina. Because the attorneys, in this case for the state, produced reams of evidence showing public use of the dry sand beach in front of Hayes Motel for not just dozens of years, for hundreds of years. Where, where do they start? With the Lewis and Clark journals. <laughs> 1803, isn't it? 1803, I think. Uh, yeah, because uh, Lewis and Clark wintered along the Oregon coast. You know, they got down to the end of the, uh, went across the Columbia Bar, and, and they wintered just right up here. And so the state's using, you know, a, a couple hundred years of data about the use of the dry sand area in this part of Oregon. And so the, uh, the, the trial court says, yeah, there, this may be, this part of Hay's property may be still owned by Hay, but at least this part here on the dry sand area is encumbered by a public easement allowing continued traversing, beach coming essentially, um, uh, along this area. Um, uh, uh, after, um, uh, many years after Lewis and Clark, um, uh, when uh, other uh, white people uh, settled in the area, um, this was the highway. Because you know, now we've got US 101 you know, over here. But if you ever drive along 101, it's, it's a dramatic drive. It's beautiful. And one of the reasons it is is because you know, they had to, it goes up and down and over these you know, bluffs and these rocks. And it took a long time to engineer that highway and build it until it was built. If you wanted to go along the coast, you drove on the sand. And so this, this was effectively the coast highway. Um, uh, until 101 was built, um, and and so that's that's why that's how uh, state parks became part of the DOT. It's because this was essentially, essentially state road. So uh, the trial court rules for the state it says it's a prescriptive easement of this piece of property. Um, it goes uh, up the chain to the state court of appeals, and then it gets to the state supreme court, and uh, Justice Goodwin. Um, uh, it decided the case, and this is the opinion that I, I was so inspired by um, in, uh, in law school. And he says, yeah, we agree with the state, but we don't want to use prescriptive easement as our theory for this case. They instead use this thing called custom. Lomita, did you catch that, the, the, the discussion of custom? What is custom? We actually have been using that for years for recreational use. So that's the tradition of using it that way. So I think they didn't want to disturb it. And that's basically the same thing for a prescriptive easement, is it not? Mm -hmm. So how, what's the difference? I think easement is giving it by law. Yeah. It's more formal. Yeah, that's true. Easement is, is, is property specific. Whereas custom is not. Custom, uh, uh, it's, it's, you can see the, the, the factors that are on, I know these pages aren't numbered, about the fourth or fifth, sixth page. Um, it says, the land has been used in this manner so long that the memory of man runs not to the contrary. Um, so maybe a bit longer than you have, uh, have to have for a prescriptive easement. Um, it's been used without interruption, peaceably, public use has been appropriate to the land. 
Uh, boundary is certain, custom is obligatory, it's not left, left up to individual landowners, um, and the custom is not uh, it are inconsistent with other customs you lost. So it basically it's how we've been doing this. It's a, a, actually, a, a, I think, a really, like I say, poetic, kind of artful way to, to be making law. It's, it's basically what, what is the custom of our culture and how we use this type of land? And is, it, is there, is there a, such a defined custom that we can say it has widened into some sort of public right? And, and there are a few instances where you can really say that's true because there's such inconsistency with how we use different kinds of lands. But with this one, this one is like, it's, it's so uniform and it's been going on forever this way um, that it was, it was uh, not too difficult for the court. It was, of course, hugely controversial because in this one opinion, um, the court declared the entire, not, not, just Hay, uh, not just Hayes property, but all 320 miles of the Oregon coast as being encumbered by a public easement, public use easement. And actually, it turns out it wasn't the entire coast because there are little segments of the coast, the rocky part of the shoreline where there isn't dry sand, um, that are not covered by the, the, the incumbents. Um, but all of the dry sand um, sections of the Oregon coast are covered by this. And so um, when I got the call, I was a brand new attorney. I've uh, been on the job maybe a year. I got a call from this muck, muckraker a uh, journalist with a, a local newspaper, he wrote from, the, uh, from one of the coastal towns, and he said, uh, I got wind uh, from this guy named Stevens that he wants to, uh, uh, he already had one motel, this is Stevens' motel, he owned the lot next to it uh, also, and he wanted to build another motel, and he wanted to extend it um, out like this, essentially. And I think probably his concept was to do to take this one down, turn that one down, and um, do this. And so the idea was to extend the bluff, right? Yeah, I know. Colin's like, what the heck? It's basically to extend the uplands. Um, extend the bluff by building this seawall out like this, backfilling it so it's the same elevation as the bluff. And then put a structure on it. What? He was not really interested in doing that. Um, he saw the Lucas case come down, and he thought this was a quick way to make a buck. And oh. so his, his intention was to go through the motions of claiming that's what he wanted to do. To set the case up, so he could take it through all the different courts to get it up to the US Supreme Court so that he could get his money. It was a retirement investment, essentially. Because these properties, um, this land up here, of course, is very valuable, very valuable, extremely expensive, on the top of the bluff. But this land down here is worth almost nothing. And in fact, the um, county assessor has uh, broken off these parts into separate tax lots because they're, they're worth almost nothing because you can't build on them. Not just because of regulation, but because what? The storms surge across them, right? Anybody who build out there would be a fool. And so um, the, a lot of the prop, a lot of these tax lots have been uh, 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 forfeited through foreclosure, tax foreclosures. You know, it's a couple bucks a year, but people don't even bother. And so Stevens had been going up and down the coastline, buying these things up for peanuts, like for you know, hundred bucks a piece, maybe. And uh, and he owned about a linear mile of the Cannon Beach coastline, and he thought if he could get this just this one declaration, he be a millionaire. That's what he was after. So, um, so the, of course, he, he was turned down. He applied, as Momita said, uh, for permission to build the seawall and then to put the motel up there. Of course, it was turned down. It was ridiculous. And, uh, and we got involved, uh, Thousand Friends of Oregon, the, the nonprofit that I uh, represented, and a couple other um, organizations got involved. And uh, we, uh, uh, as amicus parties, friends of the court, and, um, and our argument all along was, was just this point, is that he did not own the right that he claimed had been taken. His, what he was claiming was taken was his right to build something that would interfere with the public's uh, 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 right to continued access on his property. And he did not own that right. 
And that's what the court, uh, the, the Oregon Supreme Court, uh, ultimately rules. Um, so this is an example, and you see some other examples at the end of uh, the Lucas case, where um, uh, other courts have made similar uh, findings. Um, in in uh, New York, Kim versus New York City, um, the prop a property owner's duty to maintain lateral support for roads that abuzz property was a prevailing rule of property law, um, and meaning that when the placement was filled uh, by the city on the private property, it was not a taking. In Washington, there's something called the public trust doctrine, which is what part of one of the uh, arguments we made in the Stevens case um, that essentially holds tied lands um, uh, in public trust, and that was uh, held to be an inherent um, uh, issue um, that uh, prohibited uh, the claim of taking when someone couldn't build on it. Um, and I, 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 that was one of our arguments in the um, Stevens case. I hope you noticed this is, this is my claim to fame. And uh, it isn't yet in a, in a framed uh, 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 piece on my, uh, on my wall, but soon will be. This is Anna Curie also set forth an interesting alternative analysis. <sighs> <laughs> We, of course, end up saying, oh, but we don't need to address that issue because we address the, you know, resolve the case another way. An interesting alternative. <laughs> uh, is this so, okay. So to summarize, we know that when government acts in a regulatory way um, that it, it affects a physical invasion, it means there is a, a taking and compensation. We know that when government uh, acts in a regulatory way such that the entire value, entire economic use of a piece of property has been eliminated. We know that's a taking unless, unless the use um, involves a right the owner didn't own, or the use would result effectively in some sort of public or private nuisance. Okay? Good. So on, on Tuesday, um, we'll get into thornier um, topics uh, with, takings, uh, with the Penn Central case.